Bluesboro Town Board meeting. Um, for the folks here in the room, exit to your left and to your right. Um, and if you will, please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first on the uh, <clears throat> on the agenda is the public hearing regarding penalties for false fire alarms. I propose we open up the public hearing. Second. Discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone here have any comments or anything to say regarding the uh, false fire alarms? Um, the new code that we're gonna be putting in, which basically, go ahead. If you can come up to the, yeah, the mic. I'm uh, Nick DeLaurentis, Assistant Chief of the South San Fire Department. And uh, we just like to uh, say thank you for you guys taking attention to this issue for avoidable fire alarms. Um, the avoidable fire alarms, what happens is they sometimes, uh, it's repeat offenders. So we are using our resources on that alarm when they can be used on other alarms, which do happen at the same time. And um, we understand that you guys are going to try to increase the fees to uh, make an effect on this, and we appreciate that. And if any uh, questions or help that we can uh, we can uh, do for you guys, we're more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. You're in, you're in support of the local law as we have it proposed. You, you guys support it. Right? Yeah, we support it. Okay. I mean, uh, it's it's something that's not uh, at the fire departments that don't really. Um, have any on jurisdiction over as far as uh, fees and what the uh, enforcement is? Well, all we do on our part is just submit a uh, avoidable alarm after so many calls. We don't submit it after the first one or second and, or such. We feel it's at our discretion because um, we do know some of the times it's, it could be a resident that is new to the area, just having trouble with their alarm system or something. We are here to help them with whatever they, we can in any way. Some of these alarms that we are putting our um, submitting the, uh, the the form into for are people that seem to have just be negligent negligent on doing anything about it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. You're welcome. Thank okay. you. Anybody else here? How about um, on Zoom? Do we have anyone? No one on Zoom. Tony. Okay. So motion to close the public hearing. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, next is a public comment. Anyone here have any comments? Oh, we got a vote on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. So we'll start with Dan. Um, Aye. 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 We get a motion to enact local law number one, amended chapter 117 as noticed and published. And somebody can adopt that if you want. So moved. So moved. Okay. So all those in favor, do we need a roll call? No, it's not no, a budget. Not, yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> so let's just, Andrew, want to register a vote on this? Andrew, we're just voting on the local law. Are you in favor for the fire alarm? Aye. 5-0. <laughs> Aye. Aye on the fly. Okay. Uh, public comment? Anyone on Zoom? Anybody here? Anybody here? No, I think. Uh, I do have one. Carol Cernap, I'm asking you to unmute. Hi, it's Carol Cernak in South Salem, New York. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I just want to um, make a point about a concern I had about the RFP that was put out by highway for the uh, timber mulch removal. I did uh, hear back from Tony, which I appreciate, and also from Peter, uh, the highway supervisor, and understand it with th that there were three bids issued. Two did not have the proper paperwork, and I'm wondering why the third was not um, acceptable. Um, and what the timeline is for for 
putting that RFP out again for that process. And the other thing I'd like to say is you go, Nick De Laurentiis. You're a good guy. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Okay, thank you, Carol. I uh, have another. Uh, Simone, I'm asking you to unmute. Unmute. Yes. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I try to unmute. Okay. I understand. I just want to say something brief that we, it looks like we are getting the 1.8 million for the water situation. I don't know if it's true, but I read it on Facebook. I'm hoping it is. And I wanted to thank everyone involved. Um, Tony, we've had many conversations, Erica, Marissa, Robin, a hundred people, Allison, Andrea, so many. And I'm hoping that this is true. Um, so it helps over a thousand people in our town and that they can drink clean, safe water, bathe themselves, bathe their children in clean water. It's absolutely shocking how the people who begged I was one of them and banged the drums were treated all this time, only wanting the most basic of needs. Thank you to those who were muted. I was yelled at, I was called names, I was sometimes by board members and other times they just sat mute while we were yelled at. My mother's now 84, thank God. And I pray in her 85th year, if God is so kind, she will one day turn her faucet on and drink her own water. I wish the same for everyone affected and hope we can learn from this past disgusting behavior that it should never have gotten to where it did. This was never about politics for those too ignorant to grasp. It was always about doing the right thing for our fellow residents. It's simple as that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Simone. And that's it, Tom. Okay. Uh, communications, I, I have a couple of items here. Um, <clears throat> first is it's, it's related to what Simone just said. This was an email I received today uh, from Congressman Maloney's office, who I've, I've been in touch with uh, over ever since uh, March of this year, when we saw that this opportunity came first came to to our attention, um, and he confirmed. So last week, the House and the Senate passed uh, the uh, the bill that includes our uh, project for for Oak Ridge. Um, and today, I did receive a confirmation email saying that the bill was signed over the weekend by the president. So our projects are now set in stone. So hopefully that answers your question, Simone, as far as whether it's true or not. So it is true. And they're in the process of determining how the funds are gonna be um, received and what the necessary paperwork, uh, et cetera, uh, from the treasury department or other federal agencies. So I will keep everyone posted on that. Can I say something? Sure. Um, in, in all fairness, I, I appreciate Simone's remarks. And um, many of you know, I was working behind the scenes on that issue. But with regard to this grant, all the thanks should go to Tony and all the hard work he put in, in that application. Um, this was his hard work. So I need to give credit where credit is due. So thank you very much, Tony. Thank you, Richard. Yes. Yeah, it took, uh, I mean, we, you know, there were ups and downs, but uh, especially with the budget, discussions in Washington, things were delayed. This was made part of a continuing resolution that went several months and, and finally it got through. So uh, we're, uh, we're very fortunate to, to have this funding come our way. And to quote our con controller, uh, Leo Masterson, who's back here, this was a big deal for Lewisboro. So thank you, Leo. Okay, and that's the, <laughs> amount, the amount for the Total that that's 1.8 million dollars for uh, expansion of the water treatment plant to mitigate PFAS, which uh, just to uh, at a high level, what happened was New York State lowered their maximum contamination level for PFAS, and one of our wells it, it alternated between a couple of wells would exceed that um, that limit, and because of that, the Department of Health required that we put in a system to remove PFAS, and and that's what this project is. 
So it'll be an expansion of the, uh, the plant with, uh, with the granular activated carbon filtration system. As people remember, Tony uh, prepared this uh, grant application and it was one of 10, I believe, that uh, our Congressman uh, selected uh, for submission to the House Appropriations Committee within the district. So C correct. And I was, I was going to say more about this storm polling, but I'll, I'll mention it now since we're on the topic. So the the uh, the sponsors, the two sponsors for this specific um, the specific appropriations was Congressman Maloney and Senator Schumer. Uh, so I, I did work with his office as well in um, making sure that he um, uh, worked this on the Senate side. So. Well done, Great. Supervisor. Yeah, Thank you. Nice. And hopefully we'll get more of these. We'll see. Um, okay, the other item I have was a, hold on a second. This is for polling and communications. This was an email that was sent to me uh, today when, and I was asked to read this at tonight's board meeting. This came from, um, from Tisha Stapleton, Dawn Brown, Berenson, and Cynthia Ryan. So they asked that I read this out, uh, read this at tonight's uh, board meeting. Thank you for recognizing the need for a more equitable, respectful, and, and inclusive town and community through your proposed equity advisory committee. The political and racial climate of the last few years has resulted in more microaggressions or racist abuse, as Ibram X. Kendi, author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, calls it, and fear for people of color and traditionally marginalized groups in our town, including town board meetings. Given this fear, it may be difficult to find a diverse group of res residents to serve on a Lewisboro Town Equity or DEI, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee, until you can show you will support them in their efforts. Given this climate and fear and understanding that fear drives silence and raises, racism thri thrives on silence, we created equity for all Lewisboro to support underrepresented residents of color, speak up and address microaggressions and advocate for our safety, support and inclusion in community and schools. The town board can begin work on diversity, equity, inclusion, and better support residents of color right now before and if an advisory committee is formed by doing the following. Show your comments for the EI by applying a budget to the EI efforts. Uh, one of our council members graciously donated her salary. There should be available funds from the American Rescue Plan as well. Town board members can become certified in DEI through online courses such as Cornell Online. Number three, acknowledge and respond to correspondence for more residents, including correspondence discussing issues related to race and racism, regardless of who sends it. Number four, if an issue is shared, such as when a black resident shared they don't feel safe at town board meetings, then reach out to understand why so the town board can collectively take action to, why so the town board can collectively take action to ensure their safety and the safety of other residents of color and their supporters. Police presence is not the only solution. Number five, be sensitive to residents of color when determining actions and interacting. Engage and ask questions to learn and understand how actions and comments can trigger, threaten, stoke fear, or leave out residents of color and marginalized folks. Learn about generational trauma and collective trauma so the town board can be sensitive to everyone's needs and try to respond with support, not defensively. Families of color live in this town and experience racism, so please be sensitive to the message your words and actions are sending to parents and children. Number six, acknowledge and respond to all comments and suggestions by residents of color at town board meetings. It is not easy for a person of color to speak up about an issue, a microaggression or racially aggressive comment or action. Create a safe space for residents to speak up, be heard and supported. Number seven, if community members say racist comments intentionally or unintentionally at town board meetings, then the entire town board should make them aware that their comment slash action is a microaggression, is threatening, is traumatizing and insensitive, and it won't be tolerated or allowed. If a resident of color identifies a comment or action as a microaggression or racially aggressive, the town board should support them. The town board should collectively explain that everyone should be respected and treated fairly. The town board can't continue to be silent, can't continue to be silent. Remember, racism thrives on silence. Town board meetings should feel safe to everyone, including residents of color and traditionally marginalized folks. Number eight, implement the public educational forums on race that were included in the town board welcoming resolution in the summer of 2020. Number nine, promote anti-racism and respect for all. Model through example and actions. Number 10, acknowledge MLK Day, Black History Month. It should be called American History all year. Juneteenth and restate that Black Lives Matter. Acknowledge and celebrate all races, religions, holidays, people, and their traditions. Number 11, support gatherings and institutions, for example, events at the library that bring all residents together to learn and celebrate each other. Number 12, the town board, you should begin working with the, the town board should begin working with the town committees to add DEI 
to their policies and makeup. As we advocate for residents of color, we will gladly advise you without limiting our voice by being on a town advisory committee. Thank you in advance for your support. We look forward to a more uh, equitable and supportive town board. Respectfully, Tisha Stapleton, Dawn Brown, Berenson, and Cynthia Ryan. Okay, so that's all I had for communications. Um, consent agenda, uh, motion to approve the minutes of February 28, 2022. I'll move. Second. Second. Um, discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, on to old business. Discussion to on the, uh, it's an update to the food scraps program. Um, let me just see here. So basically, a couple of years ago, uh, I think we started talking about this in 2019, and I'll probably ask Bob Fishman to to um, say a few things, uh, add a few words. But um, we had uh, reviewed the, um, the the location for this work. Um, we talked about doing this at the Salt Dome, moving the recycling center to the Salt Dome location. Um, and then COVID hit and nothing got done, but we did as a board uh, agree to move forward with this. Um, and so now they want to kickstart it again. We had already acquired some of the kits necessary for folks to begin to bring their food scraps to this um, uh, recycling center or composting center. Um, and what we need now is to um, to move forward with the, uh, well, as far as the location. So we decided um, to do it at the salt will require more work. So we talked about a temporary location near the highway garage, near the current recycling center, or at the LES, the former LES building, uh, Lewisburg Elementary School. We're still waiting on the school to get back to us on that option. Um, but the, and, and this is to bring, we have two new board members to bring them up to speed. I sent some, and I'm sorry for sending it late, but I did send um, an email with some numbers. Uh, basically there's a cost, um, for the remainder of the year to do this, which uh, I checked with our controller and we're good to go with that. But it's a, um, it's a cost of about uh, 3,200 in carting costs, um, which we, um, again, there was an RFP that went out um, and it was sub, um, suburban carting, suburban carting that would do this and, and take the, the material to a composting center in Ulster County. Um, so I think this is just, okay, it, it's basically to pick up where we left off and, and agree to move forward with this. And, and Bob, if you wanna add any, any updates, uh, you can step up to the podium. Hi, I'm Bob Fishman and I'm here in my capacity as chair of the sustainability committee. Uh, so uh, Tony, in, in clarification, in addition to the 3,200, uh, which is 400 per month uh, carting costs from uh, Suburban. So that fills mm -hmm. out the balance of the, uh, uh, the fiscal year. Uh, I think we tallied an additional $538 and some odd cents uh, for some materials that would still be purchased. On top of that, uh, uh, or as you interpret that, uh, some of these funds come back to the town uh, the committee would, uh, on behalf of the town, would be selling these kits at $25 uh, per, uh, per kit. That includes a countertop uh, uh, kit, a, uh, a countertop bin, below counter storage bin uh, that can fill several of those countertop bins. And then presumably once a week or once every other week, uh, the resident would then bring that to the uh, uh, to the location where we collect the materials uh, and dump that into a, a larger trash pail type of bin. Uh, and so those kits, we would sell at $25 a piece uh, and that money would then come back to the town. So we've, uh, in the pricing here, uh, that includes ordering 100 kits. So at $25 a kit, if all those kits sold out, uh, the town would then recoup $2,500 uh, of that uh, initial investment and presumably some sort of a, a rolling fund on that for more residents to be able to uh, purchase kits. So those, that expenditure, the, those have already been purchased. 
Yes. From previously, just to be clear. Yes. Right? And then, so then we'd start getting cash back and it would, you know, there would always be some level of inventory or something, but it's a revolving thing. Exactly right. Yeah. And uh, I believe Jessica Gallagher is online uh, as well. And uh, Jessica, a uh, member of our committee was the one who did all the hard work in pulling all this together. Uh, and uh, she is the one who presented to the board, uh, I believe it was initially in January of 2019. Mm -hmm. so, right. mm -hmm. can, can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, do members of the town have access to the soil that's being created? Just out of curiosity, I know we're giving in, it goes somewhere and it gets, it, composted and all of that but right. does the town have access to any of that um, for their gardens or no i i'm not sure about them. i'm going to let <clears throat> jessica answer that but the compost facility is in ulster county okay. uh that's uh, that's able to take all this material and i believe that it may be available on a once a year basis but i'll, I'll let jessica confirm that oh so she has more of the details she has yeah she she, has she does have her hand up so okay. if we want to let her in Hi everyone, this is Jessica Gallagher. Glad to be part of the meeting tonight. So the compost or our food scraps get shipped up to Ulster County. It's the Resource Recovery Agency, the UCRRA. And what other towns have done is that once a year where they have special events like such as on Earth Day, that um, the soil comes back. But no, it, it, it goes up to Ulster and it gets distributed throughout Westchester and Ulster counties. How long is this contract for? It, it's a month to month uh, contract. Uh, so it would be uh, uh, presumably, you know, revi reviewed every year okay. uh, um, for I the pickup. I became aware of, I believe it's a, an IMA, an intermunicipal agreement with the county where they provide the bins and everything. And um, I'll look into that. I was just wondering if I, that with that IMA, it may be either even more of a reduced cost or no cost to the town to continue such right. a program. Are you aware of that? So because we are not in the county's municipal waste district, uh, which covers about, you know, 80% of the county, but the Northern Westchester communities don't participate in that. Uh, we're not paying into, as, as a municipality and as taxpayers, we don't pay into the county's uh, operation of the municipal resource recovery facility and, and other municipal waste. So we would unfortunately not be eligible to participate in that IMA. Well, thank you. That is something I did not know. Thank you. Sure. Um, so at this point, I think, are there any other, any questions from the board? Anyone else? Okay. No? Okay. Um, so, so Greg, in terms of moving ahead, assuming we, we're still waiting to hear from LES, right? To see if that's a potential location. Right. And you are looking to launch this by Earth Day. The, the thought would be yeah. to launch this on Earth Day so yeah. that, uh, you know, a bit of a splash, people understand right. uh, that this is a resource uh, that they can use and, and be able to bring their, uh, their food scraps in. It reduces, uh, it substantially reduces the uh, uh, the waste that gets carted out. It mm -hmm. therefore has a, a substantial uh, reduction in, in emissions as well uh, because the carting companies aren't hauling as much heavy waste. Right. So it's, uh, it's a real benefit. I, I do have one concern. I know with mm -hmm. the program I was citing to that the county was requiring a CICRA only for the environmental impact because I mean, I'm assuming that the bins aren't taken away every day. So the food scraps will be sitting for a period of time. And um, we live in the woods. There's lots of animals and bears and things. So I was just <laughs> slightly concerned. Have we, has that been discussed? It, it has been discussed and, and uh, explored with many of the other neighboring communities that are operating this. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, uh, there are programs operating in Mount Kisco and Pound Ridge and Bedford that are, uh, and, and many other communities, and they simply have not had these issues. Uh, one of the things that we are including in the uh, uh, in the bins is a, uh, a self-sealing spring-loaded clasp that is not so readily opened uh, by 
eager animals. Yeah, that was the feedback we got. We I, I went on a tour of the uh, site visit to the one in Bedford, and, and the person that was operating it said it wasn't you know animals were a concern because of the fact that they locked these these bins, um, and it was very busy. It was well used. I mean, the, the time that it, this was on a weekday, um, right. middle of the day, and it's constant flow of people coming in. No, it sounds yeah. great. I was yeah. just concerned because it tends it's we're in a residential area as opposed to right. Bedford, so that was just my concern. It's, well you know, founded attracting and, and, families of bears to visit more frequently <laughs> may be a little unnerving to some of our residents who live close by. So but that's the, good to hear. the county secrets probably just scale. Like if they're taking stuff from all over the county, they must have some relatively huge storage. And this is true. Maybe. We envision two to four bins, uh, you know, so no more than anybody's typical trash cans sitting out in front of their front yard. Oh. Okay. So from, from uh, the perspective of moving forward, um, do we need a, another board vote or we just... My understanding is that the expenditure has been budgeted, correct? Well, it hasn't been budgeted. And Leo, maybe you can chime in. I, I know that there's, it was budgeted originally when we approved it, but then it wasn't used. Right. Right. Okay. All right. So we probably so need we a, a motion to yeah. authorize the expenditure. All right. So I would move that we. Do we have an exact amount? Or a ballpark we were talking figure? Thirty-two hundred plus five hundred and change. So thirty-seven hundred. Yeah, I mean, thirty-seven hundred thirty-eight. Making it even four thousand, just so we've got cash flow. Yeah, four thousand. Yeah, it works. Like, okay, yeah. so um, you're authorizing the vendor's performance of the work and and the budget change, right? In the budget modification. Correct. And the right. contract's already been reviewed, I assume. Yes. All right, so, so we're authoring the expenditure of up to $4,000 to cover both the, the contract with suburban carding for, for monthly pickup of the kitchen scrap um, from, the, from the new kitchen scrap composting program, as well as additional consumables and promotional materials. And that's through the balance of calendar year 2022, I think, right? Correct. Yes, Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Okay, next is the uh, salt dome wood debris update. Uh, so we did go out to bid. We received three bids um, and all three were defective. Hmm. Right, Greg? That's correct. Uh, the bid specifications as originally written required a bid bond to be submitted by every uh, entity that, that submitted sealed bids and uh, the three bids that we received were all lacking it. So they're all defective. So the recommendation is for rejection and authorizing the re-advertising for the bids if uh, the highway superintendent doesn't think uh, the bid bonds are necessary in a project this magnitude will take it out of the, the specifications that go out with the next round. For those of us keeping track at home, a bid bond is? A bid bond is the, an amount of money that a bidder submits with a public works project so that their bid is secured. So if they walk away from it, the bond is subject to forfeiture and the industry standard is 5%. So it gives a, a low bidder a disincentive to walk away from the bid when they, when they see that they are the low bidder or that they're significantly lower than others. And they stand to forfeit that money. And <clears throat> if that doesn't happen and the bid's awarded, all the proposals get their bid bonds back. And it typically is done in a, a certified or cashier's check as opposed to a surety bond, uh, although it can be either one, but typically it's, it's a cash bond, okay? As opposed to performance, which is surety, all right? Okay. I did a resolution uh, drafted for the board to consider on the rejection and the re-advertisement there. So do we have, we have to motion to reject the 
bids and 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 motion to re-advertise, correct? That's correct. Okay. It, it is one it is one motion, correct. Right. So I motion that um, the town of Lisboa reject all bids previously received and uh, further motion that um, the highway superintendent Peter Ripiger is authorized to advertise for waste food processing services for the town of Lewisboro for fiscal years 2022 and 2023. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? Should roll call. All in favor? Roll call. Oh, roll call. Uh, yeah. Roll call. Sorry. Aye. 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 Shaw says aye. Did you need a roll call for the expenditure for 34,000? I don't, uh, so Andrew is asking if we need a, for the expenditure, if we need a, um, for the expenditure for the of, the, of the SNAP program. At that particular expenditure level, I would be okay with the, the all in favor that you did. Okay. Okay, okay next I have um, Erica Pierce. This was, uh, she's, uh, she's uh, double booked, but she is on and she wanted to speak to us about NYSEG. So Erica, if you would raise your hand. Erica Pierce. There she goes. Hello, everyone. Hello, Erica. Hi, Erica. I apologize to you that I'm coming to you from the street in Albany. Um, but this is a timely message, so I just really wanted to take the moment to reach out to everybody, uh, especially if you haven't been seeing the e-blast coming out of my office. So we have been working, um, so I'm the chair of the environmental committee, which also has purview over energy. And so on that basis, we've been working with Con Ed and NYSEG, and we've been preparing complaints for the PSC for both. But there are some very particular issues for those residents in our neck of the woods who have NYSEG. And so I really want to make certain that they are aware of the particular issues that have to do with some NYSEG billing procedures and how they might be impacting or are impacting our residents. Um, and so that's really the timely message I want to share today. So the NYSEG has a day-night meter program, which it has marketed and is still marketing as a cost savings measure, potential cost saving measures for households. Um, the idea being that you can save energy by shifting, save money by shifting some of your energy uses to the night hour. That being said, the way the day-night meter is working currently, there is no way to save money with the day-night meter. And in fact, it is a guarantee that you will be spending more money than any of your other neighbors if you continue on with your day-night meter. And so this is the really particular timely message I wanna get out to folks. Um, and just to back up for a moment, in order to have a day-night meter, you pay extra money to have the meter in the first place. The meter structure is such that you know going into it that you're gonna pay more for your daytime usage than any of your neighbors. The problem is with the current rates, you are also paying more than any of your neighbors with your nighttime rates, which means that the people who have the day-night meters not only are experiencing the same increases that everybody else is, they're experiencing them by multiple times. Um, I've given uh, your supervisor some charts which show the relative day-night meter rates um, uh, as one I, graph. I, actually, Erica, if you, if you hold on a second, I just want to share my screen. I have it up here on a projector, but I want to share sure. it for the folks on, on Zoom. Um, this is the Excel file I'm going to show. So there, you, you have a picture, which is a graph, a, a visual uh, representation of the rates, but you also have the graph. So uh, NYSIC has hidden on their website a screen where you can pull down all of the rates for any type of meter. Uh, so I pull down for a window of time, the rates for both the regular meter and for the day night meter. And if you see, I, I, if you're looking at that particular chart, I put into red all of the dates where both meters were in excess of what a standard normal reader would uh, meter would have given you as your, your rate for uh, delivery. Um, and in the case of January, that was 20 out of 30 days. Um, so we looked at this back in February. So time has gone on and the number of days where it's, it's uh, you know, in excess is, is continue to pile up. 
we know this problem isn't coming, isn't going to end anytime soon. The reason why this is happening is because the regular rates are hedged. They know that they, there are rates issues, they buy you know, appropriately to try to minimize some of these spikes in the uh, market. Um, but the day-night meter is completely unhedged, which means that folks buying off of that meter are really the most exposed of any customers. And in nowhere in their literature does that say that. In no er way Erica, so sorry to interrupt again. I just wanted yep. folks to understand the, uh, the columns that I'm showing here. So on the sure. left side, it's the nice like day-night supply charge. And on the right side, it's the regular supply charge for those right. who don't have the day-night meter, correct? Yep. If you can scroll down to where the sections start coming into red, yep. those are all those dates where even the night meter exceeds the regular rate. So not only is your day meter rate going to exceed, your night meter rate is going to exceed and your base service charge exceeds. You are getting uh, to, you know, excuse my bad language, but you're getting screwed in every possible way. So um, I, I do encourage people to consider getting those meters out. They will remove them within a week if you request it. I know a lot of the households who have these meters are older families, people on limited incomes who thought this was a good cost saving message, mess, um, uh, method for them. And there certainly have been moments over time where they probably have saved some money, but it is not really a great long-term savings plan. And it is a terrible plan for right now. Um, so, so I wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. Um, I, I know uh, some folks also who have signed up for Community Solar have seen extraordinary delays in their billing. Please get in touch with my office if you're in that bucket. Um, and, and lastly, you know, for anyone who feels that either NYSIG's long delays in billing, their estimated, their bad estimate billings, um, and this day night meter has impacted them negatively, please do two things. Most importantly, go to the PSC, to their website, and file a complaint. Those complaints will give weight to the complaints that we as the Board of Legislators are filing with the PSC. Because in some of these cases, I honestly believe NYSIG owes customers money back. So I know this was a short and quick talk through this, but and I'm coming from the streets, so I'm sure you don't want me on for a long time. But if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I, I just want to say that besides all that useful information at work, the, one of the most amazing things that you've done in your office is somehow force NYSEG to actually issue an apology, which I've, I've never seen that before ever. So. That was pretty cool. Uh, Dan is referring to the fact that they hadn't even notified their customers who have solar that they had delayed billing for them, in some cases, as many as for as long as six months. And so um, after many complaints, they finally at least sent out a notice to customers letting them know. Um, but yes, you know, I will say this for NYSEG, for all my complaints, customers who have come to us who have not been able to negotiate a way of paying their bill um, we've been able to connect them with NYSEG and they've been able to get that piece of the puzzle resolved. So nobody out there should fear that their electricity is about to be turned off because of this current issue. There are ways of, of you know, negotiating a path forward, either through my office or through the PSC, if you're not getting satisfaction directly with NYSEG. Um, but there are these billing problems that NYSEG has. We all know them. We've lived with them that have made our experience of these current rate hikes to be different from everybody else's. And that's what we're focusing on right now with the PSC, because I think that is an argument for them to have to refund some of us, some of the money that we lost you know, relative to our neighbors. We should all be hurt equally. Families, some families should not be hurt more than others. I have a couple of questions. Um, hi, Erica, thanks for joining us. Um, first question, and I've seen this on people posting social media, a lot of it. Um, if you believe that there's been a misread of your charge, you believe yep. it's inaccurate. Do you have any recourse? Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. That's my first so the, question. If you can yep. give us information on that. Sure. So the, the first thing you should do in that case is call NYSEG and, and demand that they come and re read your meter. They have been doing that for people. Um, in some cases, they've issued corrections. In some cases, the meter reads stood. 
And if for any reason that process is not satisfying to you, they don't come, they don't follow up with you, any of those kinds of things, first off, you let my office know and we will, you know, yell at nice egg for you. But also, you know, that's another issue, a uh, moment where you can complain to the PSC. Um, so, and I will make certain that Tony has, uh, excuse me, your supervisor has the links, everything anyone needs to easily file a complaint with a PSC about what's going on with NYSEG right now. And to finish up the first question, the best number to reach your office for that is? It's a uh, 995-2810 or, um, folks can email me. It's my last name, Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E at Westchester Legislate Tours with an S at the end of it, dot com. Okay, thanks. And the se my second question is, this is just educational on my part and I guess complete ignorance. I always thought, I guess wrongfully, that a utility has to propose increases for an upcoming calendar year or whatever it is, and then they, those have to be approved. Um, so every bill, has two components to it. It has a delivery charge and it has an actual usage charge. So the delivery charge that goes for the PSC, those are scheduled years in advance. There's an approval process for that. The actual, you know, delivery charge that, that I mean, the actual usage charge is different. And that has to do with whatever the, the utility is experiencing in terms of their component costs. So that's the piece that can move without the PSC's approval. That being said, there are definitely some constraints about, you know, what they can do with that. But that's the piece that's moving all over the place. Um, now, granted, every resident has the option of trying to sign up with an ESCO that has a fixed rate to avoid this kind of roller coaster ride we have going on right now. And Westchester Power's, you know, window is coming back open again. Um, personally, I'm going to be looking to getting myself back on that rate. Obviously, everyone has different options and different choices to make, and they can make their, you know, what they think is the best choice for them. And you can go to the PSC website and actually put in your information, and it will tell you all the possible ESCOs you could sign up with and their rates. And the benefit of an ESCO potentially is to have a, a, a fixed rate right. for your delivery for a certain contract right. period. Right. Not, not all ESCOs have a fixed rate, though. So you, if you are interested in a fixed rate, you want to make certain you sign up with an ESCO that is offering a fixed rate. And one other positive for Westchester Power versus some of the others out there, there is no uh, fee for getting out of your contract at any point. Some of these companies require you to stay with them for a long period of time. Um, and Westchester Power does not do that. So no early termination fee kind of thing, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thanks for the information. Appreciate it. Thank you, Erica. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Uh, questions okay, from the audience? Or anybody on Zoom have a question? I'm just seeing your screen, Tony, so I'm not. Oh, sorry. Here, let me stop sharing. <laughs> Oops. Oops. <clears throat> uh, I do have one question from Carol Cernak. Hi, it's Carol Sarna. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Is Westchester Power affiliated with anybody on the town board? Yes, Carol, with me. I'm the director of Westchester Power. So uh, is, is this collusion or is this, you know... Uh, no, I, I chose to give them as an example, but as I said, you can go to the PSC website and pull up a list Thank you, Erica. My, my question is not to you, it's to uh, the town board. I, actually, Carol, the questions are for Erica. That's what I was looking for. Okay, so I'll do a follow-up then. Okay, Sorry. thank you. So, so if you go to the PSC website, you can pull up a whole list of the ESCOs that you might you know, be able to sign up with, and it will give you all the relative rates and terms, and you can make your own choice, which is all I'm, I'm recommending that everyone do is educate themselves and make a choice, even if that choice is to stay with NYSEG. But I, I think it's important that people know what they're getting. And I certainly, when it came to the day-night meters with NYSEG, I, I truly do not believe people understood what they were getting. So. Okay, th thank you very much, Erica. Thank you so much. Thank you for putting up with my back and I really appreciate it. We'll be in touch. Thank, thank you, Erica.
Bye bye. Okay, next we have um, Stretch New York presentation. Um, Matt Evans, please raise your hand. I think you're on. Matt Evans. Oh, there he goes. Okay. I'm gonna show yes, him. good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, hi, hi, Matt. So maybe um, before you start, I'll, I'll give a uh, while I'm putting your presentation up. Um, so basically, what we're uh, the purpose here is for Matt um, to give us a presentation on the um, the enhanced energy code that uh, is being considered. It's implemented by other neighboring municipalities. Uh, this came to us on the recommendation of uh, the Sustainability Committee to take a look at and consider it. So the purpose here is to have this initial education uh, from Matt to the town board. Um, and, and this will help us with our decision making going forward. But this is basically a um, enhancement to existing New York State energy codes, which um, would then require a building design, both residential and commercial, to adhere to certain additional standards to what they use today um, for energy uh, savings. Um, so I think I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Matt and then we'll have folks ask any questions. Thank you. Is there a way I can share my screen? I see the option here, but it says I'm blocked. I, actually, I'm, I'm sharing it right now. So if you're on Zoom, you should be able to, see, you should be seeing my screen. I, yeah, I, I do see it. If you want to just go to um, slideshow, maybe that, that'll work. Just so it's yes. not cluttered with the background look. Matt, we're waiting for that to set up. Can you explain what Newport Ventures does and your position yes. with them? Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Matt Evans with Newport Ventures. Uh, we're located up in Schenectady, New York. We are a consulting firm. We do a number of projects uh, for nice startup contracts with them. Uh, under this stretch project, I'm an actual circuit rider for Long Island and Hudson Valley uh, regions of New York State. Uh, I also do multiple trainings. I have an eight hour training tomorrow. I'll be presenting uh, energy code and plan review classes for eight hours tomorrow, if anyone's interested. <laughs> um, we do a lot with codes uh, going above and beyond code minimum. And our sister company, Newport Partners is down in Maryland where we help facilitate the Net Zero Ready Homes program nationwide. And we help to do a lot of projects with the EPA, Department of Energy, and whatnot. Uh, I'm local to New York State, uh, grew up uh, in the Syracuse area and live in Saratoga Springs. Uh, travel frequently across the state uh, for numerous trainings the last uh, 14 years. So just a little bit about me in Newport, but my email is available at the end of this short presentation that feel free to copy down and email me with any questions related to the New York stretch code. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Oh, let's see. I just got to switch my PowerPoint over so I can see what you're looking at. <laughs> wow, this is tough. I'm used to doing my own slides, so. Do, um, do you want, do you want, you can go ahead and share your screen if that's preferable. That typically is what I do and what I'm used to. Uh, if, if, if you could allow me to share my screen, it would uh, run more smoothly for me, just the sure. way I'm used to doing it. Um, you should be able to? Okay, go ahead, Matt. Give it a shot. Yeah, let me see here. Share screen. Screen two. And, and then tell me which slide you're on so I can show it to folks here in the room. Uh, okay. you, can still find you will it. see here in a minute. I'm on uh, the second but slide. Is everyone seeing that okay? Yeah, but that's awesome. But they can't see it. Yeah. In other words, you will know which side he's on. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. Oh. Uh, Is everyone seeing the uh, slide? <laughs> it's late on day. Hold on. Um, slide five, you said? No, if you no, go I'm back sorry. to the I'm zoom meeting, yeah, yeah. Got it. I'm seeing what is the stretch. If I 
So if, yep. if I go to, if I share my screen, it's going to stop his screen sharing. Correct. So I can't do that. Oh, you're not directly hooked to the... To the... It, I am shown on the projector. No, not no, him. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, of course. Well, hold on. Hold on a second. Why is that? <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to exit out of this. And then I'm going to go to Zoom. Oh, there you go. Okay. We all set? Yep, we're, we're good. All right, so you should be seeing what is uh, stretch code. And I'll even put my laser pointer up there. Everyone see that, okay? Yep. Little yes. red dot? Yep. yep. Okay, we're on board. All right, so the stretch code uh, is a readily adoptable code right now. Uh, all provisions of New York stretch can be met with currently available familiar technologies by contractors, by architects. Most of the requirements that are in the stretch code are what will be in the 2021 IECC, which is already out now, but not adopted by New York Strait. For those uh, who Strait. aren't familiar, could you just fill in the initials? The yeah, IECC is the International Energy uh, Code. Okay. And this stretch code is an overlay of our existing code, which is the 2020 Energy Conservation Construction Code of New York State, which is this the booklet here. And it's based on proven technologies and systems and research uh, nationwide uh, and within the state by multiple organizations and programs. Uh, diverse stakeholder and public review was put into place for the stretch code to be adopted. And now it's up to different municipalities if they want to adopt or not. So I'm gonna run through a few of these slides here and any questions at the end, I can take them. The stretch code right now is on path to get us to net zero or more energy efficient homes than what the current code cycle is at. Uh, if we choose to stick with the normal adoption period, our energy savings for homes is not gonna decrease as quickly. The New York stretch code gets us on a quicker path to go to net zero. That will allow us to help reach energy reductions in commercial and residential buildings with 2030 uh, quotes, uh, the year 2040 with all these reductions of energy consumption, energy use and our carbon footprint. So there's a lot of benefits to choosing uh, adoption of the New York stretch. Within New York stretch, if you adopt it, you can get 1200 points for your community. You, if you are a clean energy community, uh, you do not have to be a member of the clean energy communities uh, to get these points, but you can sign up and there are grant money or fundings available, $5,000 to $50,000 available depending on community size. If you choose to adopt the New York stretch code and it must be adopted and take effect no later than June 30th of this year. And this was an extension. Uh, last year, the cutoff was December and they decided to extend it uh, another six months. Uh, so there is some period still left, it's March. So you do have time to adopt it. And some of the energy benefits are, we're 11% better than current energy code, 19% better actually for residential buildings and about 7% better for commercial buildings and energy savings. It's about a one to 2% incremental cost for new construction Payback for all climate zones, you're in climate zone four. Payback for all climate zones in New York State, four, five, and six are all under 10 years for commercial and residential buildings. You get reductions in greenhouse gases, it's far superior to what the current energy code is. Residential code gets you to closer to net zero, which is the ultimate goal down the road helps ensure verifiable performance. The buildings are tested by a third party and then addresses 40% of our energy use in our buildings. 
non-energy benefits long-term for building a better home in structure today. Lower energy use means reduced operating costs, which are very important nowadays, especially since we've seen the cost of utilities rise the last uh, year or two. Money saved in your community is more likely to stay in your community. Climate and community benefits, opportunity professions involved in higher performance building design, construction performance and verification, increase in community attractiveness, more owners and tenants desire green and energy efficient buildings, more resilient buildings and communities, energy codes help to provide healthier indoor environments and greater comfort equals resident and occupant satisfaction and comfort. Residential compliance paths are still the same uh, as code officials are aware of and builders and architects are aware of today, but we're adding in the option of passive house as well as another opportunity to meeting the energy code for New York stretch. So these are items that we get into more detail with when we go into a more in-depth training and all trainings for the New York stretch code are provided free of charge. Uh, and those are all credited classes as well. Uh, one example with the New York stretch code is right now in New York state, if a builder chooses to go the ERI path, which is the energy rating index approach, a home would need to score a 62 in the current code. With New York stretch, a home would need to score a 50 or lower. The lower the number, the better. When you hear net zero or zero ready homes, those are homes that are scoring 30 or less. When you get down to zero, those homes are producing the exact amount of energy they need and they don't have a utility bill when they're net zero. We have different software available for free. Commercial software, ComCheck is set up for New York Stretch right now. ResCheck for residential homes is also set up to approve uh, New York Stretch homes in New York State. And this is software that is very familiar to architects, builders, and code officials across the state. So they are free. Third party HERS raters get involved with residential homes passive house certifiers. And as I said, building code officials will get training for free. Um, there is one conflict that was discovered last year regarding ventilation systems in homes. New York Stretch wanted to go with a balanced ventilation system, which can be adopted. Uh, no questions asked, but you can also opt out of that. And if anyone has questions on that, that's something we would address after this is just kind of an introduction to New York stretch. And this has been dealt with by a number of communities across the state who have already adopted the stretch code. There are commercial differences between the New York stretch and the current energy code in New York state, the building envelope requirements, lighting, plumbing, and HVAC requirements, all beneficial when you go to New York stretch code. Other commercial differences is getting into electric vehicles, having parking spaces available for electric vehicles, which is something we're gonna see more and more of. Commercial buildings should be solar ready. Uh, they don't have to purchase solar right off the bat, but the buildings will be structured so that solar can be added at a later date. And then you get into different performance scenarios and energy efficiencies to make those buildings more energy efficient. Uh, existing buildings are also covered. You, no one is forced to go in and make these improvements on existing buildings, but when they choose to do a, a gut rehab, a remodeling job, uh, you might look at doing New York stretch and having requirements kick in for existing buildings, but no homeowner is gonna be forced to do New York stretch for an existing building, only if they make major changes to that house. Economic impact for climate zone four, single family homes, Total annual energy cost savings is estimated to be about $264 with a payback of 9.3 years. Multifamily payback is just over 10 years. Now, these prices uh, all were calculated over two years ago. So we know there's been a fluctuation in the marketplace, but we also know two years ago, the utility rates were a lot lower. So there's probably gonna be a greater impact on savings now than there was two years ago. We also have uh, commercial savings, construction weighted costs, energy cost savings, 
incremental costs, 85 cents per square foot for climbing zone four, simple payback of about 11 years. And then these are communities that are interested in adopting New York Stretch. Some have already adopted them. This is just in this neck of the woods for New York State. We've had multiple communities statewide that have looked at or have already adopted the New York Stretch Code. And I can fill you in more on that if anyone wants to contact me after the training, email me. I can get you information about who has adopted it. So has, any, has any municipality in Westchester adopted it, town or village? Yeah. Uh, the community I, interest. I don't know if that means adopted. Oh, yeah, no. we, have, we, have, we have a lot of interest. I don't have the document in front of me showing who has adopted it. I, I Unfortunately, I'm on, I'm on the road in a hotel room. Things. Not sure about this. Um, some case studies real quick of some developments that have already been built under New York stretch uh, in Canandaigua, New York. Uh, this is a fully net zero energy community, on-site PV, ground source heat pumps, uh, ground source heat pumps with domestic water heaters, uh, ventilation systems, passive house level insulation. And these are structures and homes that have already been built under the current New York stretch. Uh, and all these homes will qualify for tax credits of up to $2,000, Energy Star credits. A lot of uh, positives can come from adopting the New York stretch code. Uh, City of Hudson, they're looking at an adaptive reuse existing buildings. This was a slide that was sent to me. So I'm not too familiar with this project. Um, but it is a 75 unit mixed use building, panelized wall assemblies, HVAC systems or air source heat pumps with energy recovery, ventilation, humidity controls, CO2 sensors, efficient domestic hot water and PV. Right, could, you, could you go back to the, um, the, uh, the tax credit note that you had there? Is that applicable to uh, any building that's built under a stretch code regime or is it degraded? Yeah. By passive versus if, if right. they if they have the home modeled in the performance path, there's in the New York Stretch Energy Code, there's prescriptive approach, and then there's performance path. When you go performance path, the software will produce documentation that shows it qualifies for the tax credit. So that's the only way you'd be able to get that tax credit is by choosing performance path which in, in my opinion offers a lot of flexibility for the builders and for, for the architects. Uh, one of the benefits with performance path, the homeowner will have an idea of how much it will cost to live in their home before it's ever even built. We can- model well, Will the contractor charge a little more to go that path because they have to do the testing at the end? Well, the testing, blower door testing is already in the code. Uh, okay. Duct leakage testing is already in the code. Uh, a third party, a HERS rater, like something that I do, we go in, but we verify ventilation systems, airflow. Uh, we verify a few more things, but all those costs are kind of, if you think about, if, you, if you're familiar with Energy Star homes, it's, it's the same thing. So all those mm. costs, you know, every area of the state's a little bit different. Um, I guess but, I'm just trying to trying to fathom whether or not the that 2000 is is sort of included in your 10 year payback kind of thing, or is that a little extra gravy? No, that, there? that, that 2000 tax credit is not calculated in that payback period. Okay, so potentially um, a little bit a little bit extra there. Yeah, okay. that's extra, and and that believe it or not, uh, the federal government is looking at potentially increasing the tax credit up to $2,500, and in some cases, up to $4,000. And I'm not even talking about incentives you can get if you choose to do solar. But solar is not a requirement with any of the New York stretch, but it is an option where you have to have the structure built to accept solar at a later date. Simple things like running conduit and having an extra circuit in your electric panel. You know, common sense approaches that should be happening with all new homes. And, and commercial buildings. Um, so let me jump ahead here. These are resources that are available. Uh, NYSERDA has an excellent website set up for the New York stretch code. It has the adoption guide, has the model local law. Everything is already written out. Each community that it chooses to adopt the New York stretch code, 
they can take the model local law and just kind of write in your own town name, have your lawyers review it, and you can submit it to the state and get on, on for the next hearing. There's plenty of trainings and technical support available statewide. Code enforcement tools checklist. They came out with a really nice updated website that I, I actually show at all my trainings. It's a, it's a very useful tool for code officials. A single volume code manual coming out soon. Hotline for any energy code questions, technical interpretation assistance. We're here. I'm a circuit rider and I start us here to help any communities out that have any further questions on it. Uh, here are your contacts uh, for clean energy community coordinators in the mid Hudson region, which stretches down into Westchester. And then uh, myself, this is my email address for Newport Ventures. I'm the circuit rider for Long Island. Hudson Valley. And then our main contact at NYSERDA uh, is Chris Scroy. Uh, this is a good technical support page here if anyone wants to get a picture of it or copy it down. Um, but that's just kind of a quick intro. There's a lot going on with New York Stretch. Uh, this by no means covers uh, 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 any details about it, but it's kind of just to introduce it out there and get it out to the community. Uh, so that's kind of a, as quick as I could go through it, uh, not keep you waiting too long tonight, but um, if there's any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Matt, just one quick question. Uh, are we permitted to post this presentation on our website? For folks Absolutely. To... Go okay. ahead. Feel free. This, we're, okay. we're wide open. It's an open book. Uh, people have questions, we'll answer them. If you find flaw, flaws or, or concerns about it, come talk to us, we'll, we'll work with you, we'll work with the community uh, and, and address any concerns that you might have. Uh, I've been involved with New York Stretch now uh, since its inception uh, just over two years ago. Um, so I'm available and we have numerous other resources available statewide. And the NYSERDA website is phenomenal. Uh, this right here, nyserta.newyork.gov backslash stretch energy 2020. All the answers, all the questions you have are right on that website. Okay. I have a few questions. Yes. Um, we talked about additional costs and the estimate that it would be one to 2% more uh, for residential builds, correct? Approximately. Um, is, that, is that one to 2% in construction costs or does that one to 2% average increase in costs also include the additional permits that might be used, the additional inspections that are required. Um, is that included in the one to 2% or is that just the construction? One to 2% is, is construction costs. I, I'm not aware of any additional costs that would be incurred um, with respect to permitting. Uh, I guess every community is gonna be different. They might, might have to do more with permits. Um, but I have not heard of any increase in permit costs. Uh, and remember the numbers that we have were tabulated well over two years ago. So, so that doesn't, inc uh, so that doesn't include all the, so that doesn't include all the dramatic increase in construction costs and materials over the last couple of years. Correct. It does not, but what this does do, it allows the opportunity for the contractors and the architects to kind of sit back and, and really look at how they currently construct homes and consider an alternative path. Um, no, I, I, I understand all that. I, I see that over time for the homeowner who, who makes the investment, that they're going to see it over, over a period of time to pay back. I, I understand all that. I just think that we're in a very difficult time just at present. We're in a very unique period of time. Um, so I, there was, I, had a, I had a question for you regarding, um, you were saying that this would only affect, um, like if someone wanted to put an addition on their home or if, or if someone, a builder's coming in and it's, it's new construction, correct? Mm -hmm. What if, uh, and it didn't, didn't apply to already existing homes, but then what if someone decides to sell their home? Uh, you know, like right now, typically you, you sell your home and if things aren't up to code, then typically the homeowner is required to bring their house up to code before they transfer title. Is that going to be the same 
for the for this new code? This New York stretch is an overlay of the existing New York Energy Code. So whatever applies with the New York Energy Code would apply with this code. What you can look at with the New York stretch is looking at it just prescriptively is just simple things like the R values of the walls and the U factors for the windows. They just have to do something that's slightly more advanced. But I think the simple answer to that is like many of our houses don't meet today's energy code anyway. And in the same, same way, you're not required. You know, it's just a, it's an energy code. So we're, we're adopting it as town code. And so the houses aren't meeting then town code before we transfer ownership. And even though you're not required, that, that I'm just trying to yeah. understand, even though you're not required to, like, like obviously, you know, we're not required to, to upgrade because I, I don't have the best windows in the world or anything, even though it, right, it so. meets today's standards, right? Ha however, if we make it part of the town code, if, if we build new, we're going to be required to meet these standards. So when we transfer, on, if we don't build new, but then we transfer ownership to somebody else and they're acquiring a new home, are we then required as we are now to bring them up to code before we transfer? Is that I, don't, I don't believe that's the case. No. Yeah. yeah, I have not <laughs> yeah. heard that anywhere. Unless something was built that was not permitted and it was found in an inspection before the home is sold. Anyway, so I, I think we would specify very, you know, explicitly the triggers where this kicks in. It would be the new construction yeah, or the rehabs or the gut yeah. rehabs and it's, the it's transfer set up ownership. The same way as the current energy code. Are there any efforts to adopt this at the state level? There is no discussion currently that I'm aware of that it'll be statewide. Um, right now, it's it's open for any municipality to adopt and to receive grant money for adopting it. That's not to say down the road that this wouldn't become a statewide uh, item. What would that grant money, what type of grant money would we qualify for? For what types of projects would those grants be coming? Uh, let me go back. You would have to... Uh, all I know, because I'm not a clean energy community coordinator, but there is grant money depending on the population in your town of five thousand up to fifty thousand dollars in grants available. Right, but that grant you, money is expect, to build a new pool. It's, no, it's, it's, it's you're expected to use it. It's under the NYSERDA program, so you'd be expected to use it in something that had some uh, positive you know, environmental energy yeah. impact. Thank you. And, yeah. and your question there would be flexible, best though. addressed by one of the Mid-Hudson clean energy coordinators that are listed here. You know, we could probably, you could use it on like the extra cost when we upgrade uh, on a true for, uh, you know, high performance heating system or something probably, which would be fungible relative to what we're going to spend anyway. And, and the ideal result is with the New York, New York stretch is you, you now would have builders and architects building higher performing structures that use less energy and pollute less than the current energy code that's out there. So you're getting ahead of what the current code cycle is. Or people could choose to do that anyway, determining how they want to build their home. Yes, and ideally- Today. Everyone would choose to go above and beyond code minimum because when you look at the energy code, it's what's legally allowed by law, but it's nothing special. So at least the stretch code gets you up that next next level. Well, thank you very much, Matt. So any questions? Maybe, Bob, you can step up to the podium and... So thanks. Um, so again, speaking on behalf of the committee, uh, first of all, Matt, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, You're welcome. So, uh, you know, after careful consideration, the, the committee is in full support of having the town board move to adopt New York stretch code uh, 2020. According to NYSERDA, 
Uh, the cost and savings analyses demonstrate that New York stretch will be 10 to 12% more efficient than the 2020 Energy Conservation Construction Code of New York State, which is currently uh, in effect. Now, municipalities may voluntarily adopt New York stretch to ensure all new construction and major renovation projects go above and beyond the minimum code requirements of the 2020 uh, ECC CNYS. New York stretch is in effect the next version of that ECC CNYS and will become the baseline code in the next couple of years. Uh, the town board's declaration of the climate emergency recognizes the imperative of New York State's climate leadership and, and community protection act, which is among the most ambitious climate laws in the world, requiring New York to reduce economy wide greenhouse gas emissions 40% by 2030 and no less than 85% by 2050 from our 1990 levels and to achieve 100% zero emission electricity by 2040 and statewide carbon neutrality by 2050. So communities across our state must take earnest action if we are to achieve these crucial emissions reductions. In adopting New York stretch now, the town board can, can ensure that residential and commercial construction in Lewisboro will meet the essential energy efficiency criteria needed to achieve the goals of the CLCPA. We find that taking this consequential action now is vital if we're to address this climate emergency in a meaningful way. To be clear, the adoption of New York stretch does not impose an undue financial burden on Lewisboro's homeowners and businesses. First of all, this applies only to new construction and to major renovations uh, that are required to secure building permits anyway. While all such improvements are now subject to enforcement of the 2020 Energy Conservation Code by the town's building code enforcement officer, research demonstrates the cost effectiveness of compliance with New York stretch. And as Matt was presenting, NYSERDA's analysis of New York stretch in comparison to the baseline code demonstrates that building owners of all categories will save an average of 11.3% in annual energy costs. More striking perhaps is that residential dwelling, dwellings and Lewisboro's properties are predominantly residential, would realize an average annual cost savings of 19.7% through New York stretch. And I'm going to add to that, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but these figures are based on statewide energy use and therefore probably incorporate natural gas as a fuel source for a lot of that. They do. Um, right. And here in, in Lewisboro, we do not have access to natural gas. So most homeowners are utilizing oil fired boilers to produce heating for their homes. And that has a much higher emissions and a much higher cost uh, to the homeowners. So adopting New York stretch will realize even higher energy savings uh, than the figures that were in Matt's presentation showing 19.7% uh, for, uh, for homeowners. So it's going to be better than that from an energy, energy savings perspective. And um, you know, Rich, to your point, yes, construction costs have gone up, but so have energy costs. And so I, I think, you know, well, we don't know exactly what those trade-offs are. Uh, I think we can honestly expect to see higher savings overall and possibly an accelerated. But that, that's on the, that's on your, your electricity, your, your electricity costs you're talking about. But the issue is if I read the chart correctly, an average, you're talking about 10 years to recoup your, your initial investment on average, I think. So right. um, what's not broken out here, it's kind of looking at it in a vacuum. In other words, if the initial outlay to comply with the stretch code is X, how long a time is the average homeowner going to take to be able just to break even on that investment? And if you're like most, well, I don't know what the average uh, time in, in an area is, but it's, I, it seems to people are more and more transient. So you're making an initial investment that you're unlikely to get back on average. Plus the fact that you're making your cost of the, of the house when you go to sell to try and recoup that, and so you're potentially undermining the affordability of homes um, in the short and medium term. Potentially. I mean, I'm, potentially. I'm, and, yeah. and that's that's a very legitimate uh, point to raise. Um, 
there have been some studies done. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory has done a study on the increased value of quote green homes, uh, and and their conclusion, uh, and though the study is a little bit dated, uh, was that you see generally about a two percent increase in value of the home if it has lots of you know sustainable elements incorporated into it. So uh, I, I think there's a value proposition to the homeowner as well that is looking at it uh, for a shorter term, not long-term residence here in, in Lewisboro. And there's no tax incentives that you're aware of either to for the construction. I there they talk there about are. reference to grants. And yeah, so there, in addition to uh, certain incentives that are available, for example, right now, if you installed ground source heat pumps uh, right. or geothermal, uh, in nice in NYSEG territory, you would get a uh, a rebate of uh, one thousand dollars per ten thousand BTU, or roughly a, a ton of cooling capacity. So, and that provides both heating and cooling. Uh, the efficiency of geothermal systems is now approaching five hundred percent versus, say, a, an efficient boiler that might be ninety six percent. So, you you get you pick up a lot of efficiencies there. Uh, on top of that, to the question about tax credits, uh, as of today, that stands at 26% for a ground source or geothermal heating system. Uh, and uh, there is, that same tax credit is available for solar if you wanted to add solar to your property. Mm -hmm. So there are some uh, tax policy initiatives uh, in place that, uh, that will carry forward for the next, uh, I think, through 2030, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in, in that. Thank you for that information. Sure. Um, Lewisburg would not be alone in taking this action among Westchester communities. Many have already adopted New York Stretch, to your, to your question. Um, they, that list does now include Bedford, Cortland, Dobbs Ferry, Hastings-on-Hudson, Irvington, Lamaronic, Newcastle, New Rochelle, North Salem, and Osnick. So we have, our neighbors uh, have already adopted this. Um, so, I, I mean, I'll conclude with that, but... Uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, recommendation of the sustainability committee uh, was that this is beneficial to the community uh, and uh, beneficial to homeowners. And it's just a way of getting a step ahead uh, to help our community be, uh, uh, be on the right track to reduce its carbon footprint and to meet the demands of the climate emergency declaration that uh, the board enacted, uh, you know, in its last term. Great. Thank, thank you very you much, sure. Bob. Thank you. Thanks for the information. Appreciate it. And thank you, Matt, for your presentation. Yeah. I just wanted to point out my email should be a T at the end, dot net. Uh, if it's okay. still up there, it's dot net. I, I just noticed the T was missing. But thank okay. you, everyone. Uh, appreciate it. And feel free to email me with any questions. Don't forget the T, though. I'll make that correction <laughs> before I post it. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna okay, so let's move on. Um, actually, let me, let me just add a point to that. So I spoke to our, um, our building inspector. He's actually going to attend the training that, uh, Robert, you helped set up the one at the end of the month, uh, to, to one. Push back until this uh, earlier. Uh, oh, is it? Okay. It's okay. Going to be held at the, uh, right. Okay. Okay. So that's that's going to happen after SUNY finishes its spring semester. Right. Okay. To right. It's so probably May, I guess. Right. Uh, and that's going to be available to all building code uh, enforcement officials in the region. So that uh, they can get trained right. on existing uh, energy conservation code, mm -hmm. uh, and then separately, Matt's firm will offer uh, further training. On right. That training will also get the town clean energy points towards additional. Right. Okay. 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 So the objective is for, for Joe, our building inspector, to attend this training and then come back with feedback uh, that he then will share with the board. And then we can make a decision um, based on that feedback. But our building inspector 
will not be doing the inspections related with the change. So a third party would be doing. So what that. I learned actually from North Salem is that they have there's a third party that does the actual building inspection. All our building inspector does is make sure that the designs that come into plants conform to that spec, which he's doing with the current energy code. Um, so, yeah. The one thing to remember is the timeline on this. Mm -hmm. uh, this has to be fully adopted and placed by June 30th in order to get the, uh, the points. The, the credits, yeah. Okay. Okay. But is that is that in time after that uh, session? Probably early work. All right. So we did, you know, in that conversation with Joe. Yeah. And that session anyway is on the on the current energy code and it's just kind of bare bare bones sort of minimum to to sort of move move ahead. But um so it's still and, yeah. you know, he wouldn't be getting stretch training at that time. He could get stretch training now if he wanted. He doesn't need to wait for the that's right. Right. Okay. Are there opportunities for that? There are. Okay. So really, and also just to, to speak to what Andrea just said, I think our building inspector would still be doing the the building inspections. The only the third party thing was only if you're engaging someone to do the um, performance testing or something. Uh, it's for the right? stretch code piece, I thought, right? I think it's for the, uh, I think it's for the uh, end of construction. Performance right. test. Okay. Yeah, as uh, Matt was saying, that is a requirement for the current code anyway. Right. So third party, uh, it's called the first rate of home energy. Right. That's right. Uh, yeah. Rate. Okay. It's able to do that. Uh, yeah. To do that test. And okay. Certify that the homes met right. that obligation. Okay. So then everything else up to that point has to be done by our building department. So, right. So the code enforcement official, our building department is doing plan review uh, and would, when they come out to see, for example, uh, whether the installation is installed, they would see that it has met what is approved on the, the blueprints, mm -hmm. which would then have met the infrastructure. So it might be a higher level of installation right. that would be recorded in the basement, but it's still the same inspection that they're doing, same permit costs, same everything. Right. And, and also just to be clear, people listening, they, they, when you say that the current code requires that that would be if you took the the, uh, the performance based um, ap approval route, is that correct? Like you can also just do prescriptive, which I assume is just building per per code and they come in and they, yes, you've got this much insulation and stuff. Like not yes, every- that, Even that needs to be shown on the drawings that are submitted and approved by the code. Right, but they don't do a, the performance test is only for that one track. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks, Robert. Um, so I think we'll, I was gonna say, if, if anyone has questions, well, there's a couple of questions. So let, let's take a couple of questions that uh, we have from the audience. Oh, Anybody here? Oh, sorry, don't, Glenn. Don't go, go last. <laughs> Glenn first, go ahead. Uh, Faber, Cross River, New York. 1985, I built my house here. I used two by six construction for better energy. I put a heat pump system in. No one ever heard what a heat pump system was. I just put my third unit on the second floor, replaced it. Cost me $10,000 replacement. So when everybody throws around geothermal, it's a great thing, but I'd rather have you pay for it than me pay for it because it is very expensive, mm -hmm. okay? The permits will be higher because you pay building permit based on construction cost. So it will cost more besides the actual construction cost. And what do you figure? An average house today costs 500,000 to build. So if it's gonna be temp two, one to 2%, that's five to $10,000 mm -hmm. extra. It's great that we wanna provide affordable housing for people. But all these things take that affordable housing talk and it somewhat makes it less truthful, okay? That's why when I first moved here, houses were $400,000, but now with all the reviews, mm -hmm. the costs that you pay for engineers and architects, the builders gotta make money back. So now that, 
$400,000 house is a million dollars. So what happened to our affordable housing? Okay, the building department now has a hard time keeping up with reviewing plans that they already have. So now we're gonna throw this on and do you actually think a one day review that the building inspector is gonna to go to, he's gonna be able to get it like that and we're gonna just have more delays in our system. Lastly, New York State is pretty much driving the green energy in our state. It's funny how they're not requiring it. It's weird how Peter Harkham, our state senator, I would figure he'd be proposing something like that, but he's not. So why are we making Lewisboro less competitive now than everybody else? Let's wait for the state because it's great. I believe in climate change, but as we're doing this, China is building new coal-fired power plants till 2060. They just came out with, they believe energy security is their primary goal. So we're stopping this much and we're getting this much from China. Let's be serious and let's not ruin our economy to save our economy. Thanks. Thanks, Clyde. Oh, there's a couple of people on. Um yeah, a couple of questions, and these will be questions specific to this topic addressed to Robert. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Robin Lagansowski. Hi. Um, I just want to point out that our town is so far behind with all the building permits and as usual. And people, you know, if we're catching up, we don't want to put another wrench in that and make people wait. Um, who pays the third party that's not a cost taken in by the homeowner that's building? Is that right? Hello, Robin. Uh, so the answer to that question is that the, uh, the homeowner is paying for that third party inspection uh, as part of the, the work that they're doing. Uh, but remember that that's not anything that's additional in the stretch code, uh, that performance testing exists right now in the current energy code uh, in New York State. So the homeowner would have that expense anyway. Okay. Um, I just like think that we, we don't even have electric chargers in our town. Um, like we are so far behind. I think we should start like with the beginning steps that the other areas are taking. This seems like we already have 150 foot wetland setbacks and people are disincentivized to build here because it's so difficult. I built, rebuilt my house 17 years ago and not one single person on my street has renovated because the, the just the expense and what you have to do jumping through hoops. So I just think personally that this just is not like for our town right now. We should see how other towns handle it and go from there. You know, I just don't think we're there yet. We're like 10 years behind everyone. Um, it's just too much of a burden. Also, would we be getting a second or like a sec, like would Jeff move to be a co-inspector instead of an assistant inspector so that, you know, you know, Joe could get to all these extra restrictions or is that yeah that's uh, a separate topic uh, robin so yeah we, we'd have to look at what their okay. uh, resource requirements are okay uh, so that's one okay. more question um barbara thanks robin uh sure how is that perfect okay um, so basically I did, I did put a post on Facebook and I did have some answers from both Rich and Tony. Um, Tony, you did ask me to wait until tonight to make any comments or ask any questions until after I had heard the presentation by Matt. Um, I do still have some comments. Um, I did get to read a lot. I did get to read a lot of the information on both the state website and the website that Matt started. And the one thing that struck that stood out to me was it kept saying these are more stringent regulations 
than currently prescribed by law. So the first thing we know is obviously this is a voluntary um, this is a voluntary decision by individual uh, communities as to whether or not they want to adopt this code. Uh, the second thing, um, you can adopt either the commercial portion or the residential portion or both. Uh, if you are going to uh, kind of put a foot into the toe into the water at this point, I would hope that we would be starting with just the commercial portion because as Rich and Andrea pointed out, there are a lot of questions regarding cost to the residential homeowners. Um, the costs that were presented on some of the websites are not up to date. Uh, even Matt mentioned that these, these, these costs were put up uh, two years ago as to what initial outlays would be. Uh, we all know how much costs have gone up since then. And also when you're talking about Westchester, those were average costs for New York State. They were not cost specific to just our town. And it is very expensive to build in the lower Hudson Valley. Uh, so that's another thing. The other question I have are school buildings under the town's jurisdiction. For example, if they adopt a commer the commercial portion of this code, do the school buildings fall under that? Do they then have to update any of their new build? They have a lot of buildings and they have a lot of people with their buildings. They Barbara, have they do not. They do not. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for that. Uh, again, that Matt are very vague. You know, we don't. What What is a major renovation to a house? Uh, what are the costs? Um, so, as a resident, yes, I, I'm all for saving money. I'm uh, obviously I'm all for clean energy. But I think this program right now, uh, with everything that's going on, with all the uncertainties, and with the fact that you have the option to just apply it to the commercial base, it has to be looked at much more in depth. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Okay, one, one more, Dean, and then we're gonna move on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, Glenn inspired me to say something. Uh, I just wanted to agree with, with, with what he said. We, have, we obviously have a, uh, a crisis for, for, for global warming, but to me that's led by New York State, and I'm not sure why we can't follow them to make sure everything is done correctly with the maximum input of experts. Things may change as they go to adopt some of the things that are in this code right now. I feel much more comfortable leaving it to New York State. Uh, I did notice one thing in that presentation showed two, two projects. I don't know about the second one, but the first one was done by a company that benefits by designing green, green energy projects. It's the only two examples that they gave. So I just feel more comfortable leaving it to the state. We have two local crises that I think are more within the purview of the town board, and that is, is uh, you know, problems with backlog in the building department, problems with our regulations in general. Unfortunately, I know more than one family that wanted to live in Lewisboro, wanted to stay here in, in trading up. And one particularly, they just put their dream house on the market because problems building it and moved it to another municipality. It's kind of sad. Uh, personally, the other crisis we have is affordable home ownership. You know, I have a 250 year old house that was renovated in the 1960s and I spend money as I can, new windows, new boiler, and I do get a return, but I do it under my own budget. And I can't imagine people trying to get into this town, as Glenn said, and have to pay all the money for all these different projects or all these different extras. It seems we're going backwards in terms of creating affordability. Also heat pumps. I think they're a really great idea, but at the same time, this technology changes, it gets better over time. People should have that choice of what they want to in, invest in. Also, I'm not sure, how do you really get a payback when you put in wiring for solar panels, which you may not ever get, you may not have the sunlight for it. Your trees may be in the way and you can't cut them down. It's, it just seems to be, we're, we're sort of addressing, let me say one last thing and, I'll, and I will get off. The town delayed the purchase of some highway trucks because highway trucks are very, very expensive right now. The uh, most friends of mine, if they can delay the purchase of a car, they also delay it because they're so expensive right now. Energy costs are going up, but has anyone really checked what the cost of construction is? These construction items, some of them are just ghastly in how much they've gone up. I think it's the right time to be adding more costs. School taxes are going up again after being stable for a long time. 
it's not the right time to be adding these audits, particularly when this is being addressed at the state level. Thanks. Thank you, Dean. All right. Um, thanks, Robert. Thank you. We'll uh, we'll move on. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the next item, um, I'm going to ask Mike Siriano to step up to the podium. So this is a request from a local resident who would like to lives on a corner property, looking to change his address from Route 121 and cross river to Schoolhouse Road in Wakabuck. And he does have currently currently have access from both of those roads. Um, now, good evening. Uh, I represent Anthony Catunio. Uh, he's the current address is 123 North Salem Road. It's on the northeast corner of Schoolhouse and uh, North Salem Road, 121. Uh, it, uh, it has a front entrance on opening, driveway opening on 121. It also has an existing uh, driveway and, uh, and, and curb cut, so to speak, on Schoolhouse, which uh, gives access to a barn and to the, uh, to the house itself via a bridge. Um, Anthony would like to, uh, to utilize that existing gravel or dirt uh, driveway off the schoolhouse as the main entrance exit for his residence. Um, and we, uh, had, we had it reviewed by uh, the building inspector and he doesn't see the need for any permits from his office uh, because the, the existing opening on 121 will remain uh, open and available for emergency uh, fire and, and emergency services uh, uh, access. Um, so no permits are needed from the building department, but like probably every driveway on Schoolhouse Road and other roads throughout the town, uh, the, the very beginning or end of the driveway where it meets up with, with Schoolhouse or Town Road crosses a, a, a town-owned uh, easement area or road widening area. And so we have to, the existing driveway does cross town owned lands before it connects to the physical improved portion of schoolhouse. So we're asking for the easement that virtually any new driveway in town would, would need. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's any really questions for the about. board. Why is that here? Why is that? Why is that here? What triggers? Because our... you you own the dirt between oh, the, own, oh, the ownership. Okay. Between the, the ownership edge, of the easement. Easement. You own the okay. dirt between the edge of the improved portion of schoolhouse and Mr. Catunio's property line. Okay. So the objective here would be to uh, authorize the conveyance of this access easement, which um, Greg has drafted, um, to allow this to move forward. Any other questions? Is there any? And I did check with consideration the, for that. Or no? So let me um, consideration meaning money consideration for an easement. Well, yes, he's switching easement from one side of his property. Just to, switching an easement to okay. go to the other side. Well, he's yeah, he's got right. And he, he's already has, says, he already has access on Route One Twenty One side, which is State Road to the Town Road. And in my understanding, this type of easement is is typically not. There's no charge for it by the town or any municipality. So we're, oh, I'm just okay. So I'm, maybe I'm missing the point. We're just making the so it's the easement's already there. The no. driveway is already driveway there. Driveway is already there. It's an unofficial driveway. I mean, it's for not the main entrance purposes. So what the homeowner wants to do is now use this as his main driveway entrance as opposed to the one that's on 121, correct? correct? And so, because it's it's narrow and it's, you know, there's a, the speed of cars on 121. No, I get all that. I just, what, what prevents, what's preventing the homeowner from doing that now? Oh, because he, he, we, we went to the receiver of taxes to get a new number, number X Schoolhouse Road. And, and she's ready to, I think there's a number reserved already for this air for this particular lot, but she she's not going to issue that until she hears from your board that you're okay with granting the easement. Okay, so we're just she doesn't want to issue essentially. She doesn't okay. want to issue an emergency uh, address number without over oh, a nine one nine one one nine one one. Okay, okay. <clears throat> and and this has been discussed over time. No. You know, maybe over okay. A year I just, or so, I just, my my only I, point is whether we needed to do anything at all. 
that's well, we, we so I did verify with the our tax receiver, our town assessor, our building inspector, uh, Golden's Bridge Fire Department. They had a requirement of having the new address posted on the Route 121 side. Okay, and, so, and so, so, so okay, it. so it goes back to a 911 issue and designated, right? Et cetera. Got it. Okay, right. So, this. I mean, I'm fine with that. It's okay. Like, you know, okay. Not hard move this, to, move this, to adopt the resolution. The resolution is to authorize Tony. Just so Tony. authorizing conveyance, conveyance of access, of access easement easement. and giving yeah, yeah, Tony yeah. the right to, to execute the documentation well, necessary. Okay. And so subject to is a roll call. And this easement will run in not only in Mr. Catuno's favor, but his Perfect successors and his signs, meaning future owners of the property. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Subject to a permissive referendum, just saying, you, you, you theoretically you're conveying a property interest. Okay. So. Okay. Just, okay. Um, move for the resolution. Motion for the resolution to adopt. Second. Subject to public referendum. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, roll, roll call. Andrea Rendo, aye. 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 Mary Shaw, aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, okay, so next we move on to, uh, this is a waiver of, of the pure procurement policy for Fox Valley Lower Field. So this is, there's a couple of projects associated with this. One is the new scoreboard. Uh, this is for the Lewisboro Baseball Association and batting cages. Um, so uh, the cost is approximately $20,000 for the scoreboard, 25,000 um, for the batting cages. And um, and so he, the, the motion will be to uh, waive the provisions of our procurement policy and accept the proposal of Northeast scoreboards and also the proposal of sport tech construction. So we'll, we'll treat them separately. Um, so we'll go with the first one for the scoreboard. Um, motion to waive the provisions of guideline three and its adopted procurement policy and accept the proposal of Northeast scoreboards. What's guideline three? Okay. Guideline three is requires for uh, public works projects between ten thousand dollars and thirty four thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars are supposed to have our fees. Okay. Two for two for two. Okay. Keep a smile. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now we need a roll call. Andrea. Yeah. Aye. 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 Shaw, aye. Okay. okay, next one is a motion to uh, for the town board to waive the provisions of guideline three in its adopted procurement policy and accept the proposal of sport tech construction of Bruce in New York for the installation and construction of batting cages at Fox Valley Park at a cost not to exceed 25000 in accordance with the proposal dated March 3rd, 2022. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Roll call. Andrea Rendo, aye. 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 Shaw, aye. Thank you. And, and just to add a note on, these are projects that are, um, we would be looking to get reimbursement on from the SAM grant of a couple of years ago, 2019 SAM grant. Um, this is for LBA. Um, okay. So, uh, the next item is a waiver procurement policy requirements for the fireworks. Um, so the price um, in the resolution, it's 14,100. I got confirmation from Dana. Yeah. So this is a, we, we talked about this at the last meeting. So uh, this is a, a motion to accept the proposal for our annual fireworks display um, and waive the provisions of guideline three and it's adopted in the town's procurement policy and accept the proposal of international fireworks of Douglasville, Pennsylvania, Northeast for $1,400 for years 14, years 2022 and years 2023. $14,100, sorry. Seems to, well, I always thought like in the budget, does, doesn't the, in the fireworks orders around like 25 grand? Is that the like total cost? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because yeah, yeah, we're, we're so proposal for 14 grand we're approving on the fireworks. So that's all, yeah, that's all in all the other costs, I guess, right? The event. Personnel, the music, the 
Okay, this is just the, the this is just fireworks, fireworks stuff, correct? The fireworks okay. portion, not the accoutrements, which bring no. it up. No, okay, got it. Okay. So, uh, do I have a second? Second. second. Oh, sorry. Discussion. Second. Discussion? Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Roll call. Andrea. Aye. 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 Shot. Aye. But well, we're still accepting donations towards this event. Right. Correct. Right. And sponsorship. Okay. This is another, this is an add on. It's not on the agenda, but it's a similar thing for the, uh, also for Parks and Rec. It's for the concession stand at the Lewisboro Town Pool. Um, so we, we've, uh, uh, Dana went out to, she put out an RFP. The response came, that came back was from a company called, um, where's the name here? Westchester Food Service for $8,400. For 2022, 8,450 for 2023, and 8,500 dollars for 2024 to run the concession stand. Were they the only bid or the lowest bid? Um, I believe they were the only bid. Only proposal. Yes, the uh, highest bid, not the lowest bid. Right? I, I think right. that there were others that were not acceptable. That they didn't, they didn't meet properly the meet the criteria of. The they didn't RFP. meet the bid requirements. Right, Correct. exactly. So this is so the one defective. that did. This is the only non defective bid. Uh, Correct. That's what I, I should have. So, yeah. So I just want to, you know, maybe I, maybe I missed a beat or something, but those these numbers are the numbers that they're paying <laughs> us for the. For the uh, sorry, yes. fees payable to Lewis. But yes, correct. Yeah. $8,400, not a cost. They're paying us yeah. for. Yes. Okay. And then they make money on. Right. The the hot dogs. Yeah. Right. yeah. This is the Thanks right for to operate. clarifying that. This is the right to operate the concession. Right. Correct. Right. Yeah. Just for how many? How long? Three years. Three years. Okay. Three years. Three years. Okay. Yes. So okay. do I have? Um, um, uh, I think I motion. Do I have a second. 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 Oh, go ahead. I Thanks, second. Mary. Discussion. All in favor. I have discussion. Aye. 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 Is this, sorry. Is this the same concession company that's run it in the past? Or different um, than the one we had last you year. You know, Mary. I, I, I know. believe it's. I think it's, it's I, yes, Dana. I, Is she on? Is Dana on? Dana, are you on? Um, let me check my email. See if she said. It's the only one we get, right? Yes. Yeah. However. Yeah. I, um. Mr. Falsetti, based on the circumstances of the of the R of the bids received and the defective nature of what two out of the three of them, is it still another option to put it back out? Or it, it's always your option, but it's an RFP. You're not you wouldn't even be bound by the by the highest in this case uh, proposer. You if you that's, if you preferred one for other yeah. reasons. But this wasn't a formal bid. It was an RFP. It was an RFP. So you you have right. a lot of leeway. You, you yeah. can accept it. You can I, seek okay. new new uh, new proposals, I'll, but I'll tell you why I'm I'm asking the question because I received a lot of negative feedback as to the food service that um, out of the out of the pool uh, last year, and so I, I have no personal experience. Um, I did not purchase anything at the concession stand at the pool, so I have no personal uh, knowledge or experience. But I did get some negative feedback about that, and before we go ahead and do this, I thought. Perhaps that do you, do you want to hold off then? I would, have time. I would like to, to if it was the okay. same food service that that um, had the concession okay. stand last year, we may just want to give others an opportunity. Yeah. Um, my, my message isn't going out because of bad cell service. So that's not on the agenda. Need a cell tower. No. All right. Uh, so Janet, we'll... Janet has an answer. I no, I I set my text is going through. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Dana. But I'm looking at Dana's communication on, on this particular uh, matter. This was the only response that came back. That's they sent I'm it out to four or five local vendors, including prior vendors. So I think maybe you want to clarify that this isn't a prior vendor or, or it is for your own education. Right. But only one number set of numbers came back. Okay. Out of the four or five that they sent it out to. So you, you just have to do it sometime before the season. Correct. You have some time for that. Yeah. Well, would anybody have any objection to putting it on to the next meeting only not to find out that and then we can decide if we're going to move ahead or not? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So let's uh, defer it to the next meeting. Okay.
Okay, so next on the agenda we have, uh, this is gonna, it's a resolution of private use of Town Park for STAR, which is the Solid Treatment and Research Foundation fundraiser on May 22nd, um, their annual ALS therapy, no, I'm sorry, uh, and waving a fee. So here's uh, just a description for folks on STAR. Um, uh, this was provided by Jessica Klein, who is uh, spearheading this effort. Uh, Star Foundation wholeheartedly believes that no childhood disease is too rare for proper research and viable treatments. We are proud to be affiliates of Montefiore Children's Hospital and Einstein University's Rose F. Kennedy Center. Our event last year hosted, hosted almost 500 people. We had a disabled petting zoo. Yes, with a one-eyed duck and three-legged bunny. Uh, pony rides, magician, tie-dye t-shirts, and created care cards for children, children battling serious illness at Montefiore. Miss Wheelchair in New York even made an appearance. Since our start in 2019, we have given over $400,000 to institutions like Einstein University, Montefiore Children's Hospital, Greenway Genetic Center, and the National Institutes of Health. Just this year in February, the World Symposium of Rare Diseases bestowed to STAR the, the prestigious young investigators for our research and groundbreaking approaches to treatment. We are eager to continue this work and hope to bring a wonderful rare community event to the Lewisboro area, a family-friendly event designed to uplift and promote funding and awareness for rare childhood orphan diseases. Thank you again, Jessica. It was very successful last year. I think it was, it was the it was the event that kicked off the season of events for all the spring and summer, I believe, and it was highly successful. Great feedback. On the Agreed. Andrea Rendo moves. Rich, second. So. Discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the next is the uh, resolution authorizing the 20th annual ALS Therapy Development Institute's tri-state trek to cycle on town roads on June 26, 2022. Um, they have done this in the past, if I recall. Um, this is the 20th annual. Um, and this just a, a little bit more about the, tr it's the tri-state trek raises funds and spreads awareness of the work ALS TDI is doing to find an effective treatment and cure for for a horrific disease, every 90 minutes, someone is diagnosed with ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease or motor neuron disease. Uh, it is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that causes muscle weakness, difficulty breathing and swallowing, and paralysis while leaving the sense and senses intact. Currently, there is no effective treatment or cure. So motion to, um, uh, to authorize uh, the 20th Annual ALS Therapy Development Institute's Tri-State Trek to cycle on town roads on June 26th. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion. Just one uh, thought here. I see in the letter, it says that um, they're going <laughs> to let us know any rest areas that we're planning to stop in your town. Maybe we could lobby for an official um, stop uh, in wherever, Cross River, to uh, get all the bicyclists to stop by and frequent uh, town businesses as far as uh, to do that. The in the past, the they've used the town park. They don't need to use it this year. Oh. So the town park was their rest area? Mm -hmm. Okay. Have, have you any of you seen the rest area during any of these bike marathons? I, I participated, so I know. And you, I'm sure you, you know as well. I have, like, at the Golden's Bridge train station parking lot. Right. Yeah. In, in, in the shopping center, it is very overwhelming. Yeah. Very overwhelming. Um, it, there's bicycles everywhere, and it, it, the town park is a more appropriate location because there's a lot of resting going on, a lot of bikes all over the place. And um, I understand your intention, but um, it, it wouldn't well well work well. Okay. Well, I just want to see there's an opportunity to get some revenue from that. No, agree. Bicyclists going through town. So. I don't think they'd have much on them <laughs> as far as. Not a lot of pockets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The other thing okay. is um, less opportunity for a potential conflict of road space. Okay, for the shot. Okay, so okay. Um, so all, all in favor? favor. Aye. 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 Last but yes. I don't mean to interrupt. Okay. Dana did get back to me. Okay. And she said they have been on and off with us for the past twenty plus years. The past three years was a pizza place out of Sleepy Hollow, Roma's Pizza. The past three years. Correct. So, okay, so it's not the so same. It's as, not the it's same. Somebody that we, that had, we have had in the past. Absolutely. Okay. So we've had 
this Westchester three years ago. Right. Okay. Do we still, do we want to still? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll still defer it. Um, Table the resolution. Yeah. So next is the resolution to approve City Carding Inc.'s application for license to collect and dispose of refuse and recyclables um, for the town. Just uh, Janet, which, no, no. Is no that particular issues with them today, right? Pardon me. No issues with City Carding. Not anymore. Yeah. I, I just noted in the paperwork that the certificate of insurance coverage for the disability and paid family leave benefits law is a different company. Wind Carding. Oh, it's Wind. Wheel Wheelabrator Technologies Holding is the name on that, which is different from maybe that was just a typo and they carried it over from something no, else. No, I think they got acquired. They got acquired by Wind, but right. That was a little while ago. It's probably, it's probably a little greater, but it should at least say DBA or something in there that mm. reflects. Right. So I'll, I'll call him. Yeah, because the, the workers' comp work. certificate has City Carding Inc. And the other certificate for disability has a different company. Maybe they just, the broker didn't carry it over. So well, to approve. Just make sure we have the contingent right on, yeah. on the uh, fixing up the little name of insurance. Mm -hmm. Do I have a, sec a second? Discussion. All in favor? Wait, wait. Oops. Are we contingent on, okay. on um, a proper uh, insurance certificate I think that's being what supplied he... and reviewed by okay. our town attorney? Sure. I like that. Fine, Thank me. you. That works. Good. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So um, that's all I have for new business. Um, public comment. Number two. Number two. Anyone here? Nobody here. Oh, Leticia, you have. Do you want to make it? Oh no! Anyone here? <laughs> oh, sorry. Hello. <laughs> so, you? Would you like to make a public comment at this time? Oh, well, we have a couple of hands up. Yeah. Simone, I'm asking you to unmute. Hi again. Um, I listened to the letter during the communications and I wanted to discuss microaggression, which is micro small, or, uh, versus macroaggression, large, with three questions. Is being called a racist when asking for clean water for others macro or micro? Is having a letter containing false and damaging statements read about you and your husband macro or micro? Is making someone feel threatened at a meeting demanding they leave, macro or micro? I'm just trying to understand. And Andrea did something really admirable by giving her salary back to the town. And five minutes later, it's being asked for. It's just shocking to me. The fact is in our town, squash stickers are being drawn all over. Does that hateful act not warrant it to be dressed, addressed by itself? I, I don't know why it doesn't warrant its own committee or whatever it is that you all want to do. I cannot understand that logic. Dan, I, I really have to tell you, I try and stay away from this with all due respect. You are truly who I think of when I think of term limits. Over a decade on this board, you never once addressed the dirty water in Oak Bridge or Meadow Pond or did anything about it. And you have a petition from me on your company, a town board meeting. If that's not unethical, I just don't understand the definition. Have you taken enough from Louisboro? Thank you. All right, thank you, Simone. Uh, next, Carol Cernak. This is Carol, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. 
Um, I would like to first kick back to uh, my, my question about the um, possible interference with the town board and the uh, Westchester Energy, um, whatever he calls himself. I'm still concerned about that and I don't know why this is allowed. It seems like collusion to me. I was um, silenced before, but it's still a concern. The other thing is, um, I wonder why a 120 acre farm that's been in the family since 1940s is under a building restriction of nonconformity. And I would like the town board to speak to that. Um, you know, we're trying to make renovations and, and doing, thing to, doing things to best improve this property. And we're hitting roadblocks under um, that were nonconformity. So if anybody could speak to that, I would appreciate it. Look into it, research it, and get back to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carol. Uh, Jimbo, I'm asking you to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. We can yes. hear you, Jim. Oh, wonderful. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Jim O'Connor from Vista, uh, AKA Jimbo from Vista, uh, AKA the agitator, according to uh, the record review. Um, I hopefully will not be muted like a few people have been muted tonight, but I want to talk about something and actually Glenn inspired me to speak uh, tonight. Um, global cooling, if we remember in the 1970s was a great slogan, Glo and that didn't work. Global warming in the 90s, that was a great slogan, but that didn't work. Ah, climate change. I guess that's a perfect slogan. Uh, I do believe in climate change. I do believe the weather changes, and over a millennium, the weather does change. But one thing throughout many years of what I have done through investigative work, I've always followed the money, followed the money and the power. Well, I have followed the money and the power, and that prime example is a town board member who is the director of Sustainable Westchester. He sits on the board, and he's been sitting on that board for quite a long time, and it's a nonprofit organization. And according to the financials, which I was very, very happy to see, update to 2020, which was in the prime of COVID, I went over some of the financials and I did some mathematical work. And over the course of three years, from 2018 to 2020, the certain individual sits on the board. He worked 120 hours. And in 120 hours, he made roughly $328,571. And that roughly comes out to $2,738 on an hourly rate. That truly is amazing. So when you talk about power and money and pushing an agenda, I firmly believe that there is truly a conflict of interest. And I was told that the ethics board that we have is supposed to have three people on it, but there's only two people on it. When I tried to find out who the two people are, I was told that basically it was none of my business. So again, I will be emailing, trying to find out who those people are. Um, and in regards to a certain town board member, I'm not mentioning names because I don't want to be muted. Um, he said several months ago that he was going to recuse himself going forward in regards to the sustainable Westchester. Well, to recuse yourself going forward means that something happened in the past. Well, and you say you recuse yourself going forward, but that was a lie because ever since then, every single town board meeting since you've been promoting your nonprofit organization where you roughly make over $328,571 in three years. And especially in COVID, you made $125,000 and $703 while everybody else suffered with the lockdowns. Thank so you, if I make any of this uh, up, I encourage you. everybody to go to the financial statements. Thank you.
Okay. That's it. That, uh, that appears to be it. Okay. Okay, so um, we need to comment. move the uh, public comment be close. Uh, yes, so uh, motion to close the public comment. Thank you. So moved. Second. Um, second. Okay. No. Discussion? No. I don't think okay. we don't have to. Okay. All right, so we're mm -hmm. public comment. Um, approval of claims or motion to approve claims. Second. We have to uh, approve the one we deferred. Yeah, I was gonna. Yeah, do that during pulling of the board. Okay, well, it's mm -hmm. it's not in the one. current claims. Well, is it? It's not in current claims, right? No. So to do separate so from the claims that we do a separate you. motion during polling. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually gonna speak to it during polling. I so I could speak okay. to it now. Well, yeah, let's go. Let's go ahead. So so last month we deferred uh, payment of uh, the KLSDs. Um, the rent to KLSD for the town's um, lease with the school district for LES. Um, we had just, as I mentioned in the last meeting, I had been talking um, when I started this job, um, reviewing the facilities and, and talking to our employees about things, you know, areas that needed to be improved. Um, I had been talking to the uh, school district's uh, maintenance folks and uh, in early February, we made a list of issues that needed to be uh, addressed. Uh, those issues were we had a follow up meeting um, a week and a half ago, and those issues were uh, then documented and for the most part, uh, with the exception of one, uh, have been addressed. Um, I can go through them uh, one by one if needed. I sent this to the, the spreadsheet to the board. Um, but for example, uh, situations where there was no instant hot water, they replaced a uh, circulation pump. Uh, in a situation where a, a men's bathroom door was uh, not closing, um, actually this was a, a, a door that was missing. Uh, they, they fixed the door. Uh, there was also a door that had a missing um, door closer. Um, I, I, yeah, there was another item that was requested in terms of uh, um, uh, segregating a door that has uh, glass that uh, where people come in to the building, they can actually peer into the unused portion of the building. Um, and, and so they've tinted that glass or blocked it. So we don't have that view. Uh, the stained ceiling tiles, stained or sagging, those tiles were uh, provided to the town's maintenance department. And, and, and that's part of the landlord tenant agreement that we have. Uh, heat deficiencies reported in um, the building department and in the filing room. Um, they checked all the, uh, the settings for the BMS. This is the controller system. Uh, they, they were all, all been corrected. Uh, the control contractor will continually period periodically check those valve actuators. Uh, gutters, this is the one where we had issues with water leaking down the exterior wall and coming into the interior of the building and some, some parts around windows specifically. Um, it, it's not completed. Uh, the maintenance department will follow up. Uh, this is also part of a larger project that the KLSD have to fix uh, and, and I think re replace most, if not all, of the roof. Um, so that'll be part of that work. Um, a couple of other items, courtyard appearance, that's not part of the lease. It's we're, we're going to address that separately. Um, I, I had asked, this was in my earlier meeting back in February, if signs, you know, to, to make the, uh, the building more um, easier to navigate for folks, for town residents. So that, that's something that we're doing. It's not part of the lease. Um, synchronization of two clocks in the courtroom, uh, which has been a, a complaint of the, the judges, uh, that's in, in progress. Um, so with that, I would like to go ahead and authorize that we uh, pay the rent, which is due by tomorrow. And before we incur, start incurring interest. Right, well, it, it's, uh, I just want insurance. to uh, thank the supervisor for his, uh, uh, for his work on this and then leading and going through the list that you ticked off. These are all things that our landlord or the school district has undertaken to address in accordance with the lease we have. And I uh, just want to say I appreciate uh, the school district, our landlord stepping up and uh, meeting their obligations uh, under the lease so that our town employees, as well as the public, have a reasonably safe uh, place to uh, work and frequent. Thank you. 
motion to approve all claims or just the school district claims for motion? Yeah, I think we we motioned did we motion already to to accept the claims? This is a separate. We did, we did. We did right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all claims including that. One. So now, yeah, as we're, amended. So right. we're, we are as amended. As amended. Yeah. So motion to approve payment to KLSD of the Mark Trent. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Um, so that was going to be a pulling of the board item. So I'll stick with pulling of the board and, I, and I'll, I'll go next. Um, I have one more item. Did we vote on, on the, the other claims? Yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah. So this is a it's a program that's on April 23rd at 10 a.m. Saturday at the Lewisburg Police Department parking lot. Um, together with the KLSD special education group uh, that's made up of uh, uh, several parents in town. Um, they have arranged together with Chief Alfano an opportunity for kids with um, that part of the, that are part of the special education program or um, IEP 504 is a, designation they use for that program in the district to meet the Lewisboro Police Department and more importantly to have the police meet the kids. Tentative date is 10 a.m. 420 April 23rd Saturday at Lewisboro uh, Police Department parking lot. Police will discuss relevant topics with parents such as their autism training, the police department's autism training, silent approach, tracking devices, and other safety measures. Police canine, patrol cars, slash ambulance, and more will be on display. Um, so if anyone has any questions or if they're interested in, in attending, um, I don't have the contact information here, but what I'll do is I'll get the contact information, but you can also reach out to LPD um, or send me an email and I'll make sure to get it, get it to the right person at the KLSD special education um, group. Um, that's all I have. Uh, Mary, do you have anything? Um I just want to say um, people talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion should consider the meanings of those words. Inclusion means to include everyone. It doesn't mean that it's a zero sum game and that we have to consider just one group of people or another. We are all citizens of Lewisboro and we should pay respect to one another. It, it, it's just common decency and, and no one should have to be afraid to come to a meeting. Um, we, we should make sure that everyone has the right to say what they believe. And, and if someone is not behaving in a considerate manner, then steps should be made to take address that inappropriate behavior and and we can help each other feel welcomed and warmed without excluding other people and and for those of you who celebrate holy on March 18th, I want to um, hope that you have a great celebration of good over evil. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Hin Hindus celebrate Holi as a spring festival, and it's a festival that's full of color and love and good food. And um, it's a wonderful thing. And it's something that I'd just like to educate you all on. So that's pretty much it right now. Thank you, Mary. Um, just an update, I just received a message, which I, I can't open, but I think I, I can read the beginning of it. Regarding that event for with LPD, questions can be, if, if anyone is interested, they can address uh, or inquire with Matthew Goglia directly. Um, his email address is Matt, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, Matthew, two T's, okay. Goglia, G-O-G-L-I-A, at gmail.com. Um, thanks for sending that, Matthew. And, and for some reason, I can't open the entire message. I don't know if it's my connection here, but thanks for sending that. Uh, Rich. Um, two things. I was uh, very upsetting to hear that there was another swastika incident at the junior high school. Um, suffice it to say, I think we're better than this Lewisboro. And on a positive, uh, more positive note, happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. 
Thank you, Rich. Andrea? Uh, well, there has been, there have been several uh, inquiries uh, with people uh, contacting the town board and um, asking for uh, a portion of the salary that I donated back to the town. Uh, just so everybody knows from the time that I took office to now, I've been consulting with the town attorney and um, okay. with our financial advisor here, Leo Masterson, on how exactly to direct the funds to the areas um, that, that I wanna see it directed to since I, I donated back to the town. Of course, <clears throat> the spending of this, we discussed with my fellow town board members and they will all be aware of it. Um, I already had some ideas coming into January with where I wanted to see that money go. And uh, I'm gonna discuss my ideas with the town board and um, you will all hear about it when, when all the logistics are figured out. Thank you and happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. And we're grateful for that donation. Ben. Um, I'll just say um, I'm, I'm thankful for the memo from Equity for All, Boothboro. There's a lot to um, absorb there. But one place that I'm thinking we should maybe start is to think about trying to find somebody to do a workshop for us all. Uh, and maybe for, you know, for all the staff on, you know, recognizing these microaggressions. I know there's a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, interest in that today and, uh, and things like that, just to have a, a base from which to then, you know, proceed with, with more discussions. So we have, so I would recommend that we we look around for that. Maybe maybe Mary, I know she does a lot of the sort of training type stuff. Could could look around and see what's available for us. That's it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so next is uh, let's see. Um, I don't have any other announcements except the next town board meeting, March twenty eighth. 2022 at 7 30 p.m. I would like to do it back at the townhouse if if you are all in agreement. Where is that? <laughs> Stop, right there. <laughs> I haven't had the pleasure in my time. Is that okay with the board members? If we can do it with the I mean, technology. I mean, sure. I have absolutely to say it would be even easier. More comfortable here, but <laughs> yeah, it's easier on it, our it, guys to set up. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's fine. And then we'll yeah. the no more dig in. But can, can I make better. a suggestion? Sure. And I know that some things have changed. Might we consider doing them in different parts of town again? Absolutely. If there's like a town, yeah, we, we can certainly do that. Just um, yeah, you know, because as we had talked about, it's uh, not oh. everyone from yeah. all the different parts of town are willing to truck over at night to for an in-person meeting, and perhaps if mm -hmm. we traveled a little bit, I'm not saying every time, but a few times a year, we should try to make an effort to yeah. appear in different parts of the town. About, I'd uh, look forward quarterly. to the Vista meeting. Once, yeah, we've done that a couple of times. Like, yeah, whatever there was a at least once local issue. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I wonder if there's an opportunity to even do it maybe of a, to a business to like host it if we had it. Yeah. <laughs> be cool. I hear you guys. Yeah. It's not. Well, we, had, we had we had a we had a debate yeah. at, at an empty off an empty space in, in Golden's Bridge. In Golden's Bridge, it set yeah, up quite said. nicely. Um, at, maybe at the point where they are ready to present their new vision, they are working on updating the shopping center. So you can coordinate with that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. We have we'll a session that. at the Black Mansion ruins under the lights. That would be cool. A nice Great. Great. summer night. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so um, so that's what we'll do. So next board meeting, March 28th, 7.30 p.m. at the Lewisboro Town Hall. Motion okay. going into executive session. Motion to go into executive session to interview somebody for a committee. Second. Or for a board, actually. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right, good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.